Good evening, everyone. I welcome you to this unique multi-zonal symposium on ethics and anesthetist. A section on medical ethics has been published by NNC. As anesthesiology has experienced exponential growth in technology, improved safety profile of anesthetic drugs, increased dependence of other branches on us, has led us to emergence of various issues, legal, medical, and ethical. Today, we have a novel concept where young speakers from various zones will present their presentations and they will be guided by the seniors from their zones. Before we start our session, let us invoke the blessings of Ma Saraswati. It is my proud privilege to invite our Honorary Secretary, ISA National Dr. Bajwa Sir, to address the gathering. Thank you, Dr. Parul. First of all, rather than me, it's always the academic chairman he is waiting. So, Bhameshwar, sir, you, yeah, your good evening, words, words of wisdom. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening, Dr. Bajwa. Sorry, I had to join late because I was not able to open the link. Probably something must have happened. Anyway, uh, I, at least I, I was able to... Uh, it's, uh, I mean, a wonderful topic selected, uh, this uh, about ethics and all. Uh, I think everybody will be benefited with the with this topic, and I'm sure you have selected the best speakers uh, for this topic. And uh, these uh, things are going on very well, and I'm I'm very happy that uh, this uh, weekly programs will be continuing in a uh, till the long days. Thank you very much, Dr. Bajwa. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, speakers are always best, sir. In the PG classes, there is no compromise. All the PGs are uh, these PG students as well as the moderators and speakers. They are one of the best. And we also make it sure that every zone is represented in these classes rather That's than right. just uh, having from one state or two states or from one institution or two major institutions. The preference is for the basically peripheral institutions which don't get chance to highlight their cases in the national conferences or even on the national webinars. So that is a strategy. Regarding this, uh, I think all the five zones are there. The north zone is being represented by me only. So whatever is lacking in ethics, I will be dwelling upon those things. Uh, yes, sir, the topic is very apt. It is the most widely taught and preached topic and uh, minimally followed, to be very honest, especially in the peripheries, if you ask me. In the yeah, institution, yeah. there is a check. In the institution, there is always a check, maybe by a danda or by a you know, say high moral characters, but ethics mm -hmm. in anesthesia are very, very important. And we are proud to have this, you know, ethics in our blood because whosoever the teacher mm -hmm. in anesthesia are, they always go for the ethics because just like a pilot is sailing the, is getting flying the, this one aeroplane and where the ethics will definitely, if you are not going according mm -hmm. to ethics, you are definitely land in problem. And there are many other things are medical legal, then uh, there are other, I think, clinical problems also. And your self-conscious, plus the teaching, plus the role models and what ethics we followed in COVID, nobody can match, no specialty can match anywhere in the world. So let's start the topic today with the, we are, PGs are waiting to deliver their talks and the moderators are also waiting to at least dwell upon this very important topic. 
सो आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर पारू यू स्टार्ट द क्लास जी थैंक यू सो मच सर मैं स्टार्ट द सेशन विद योर परमिशन आई बी एबल टू शेयर माय स्क्रीन नाउ good evening everyone once again on this multizonal symposium uh, there are a few guidelines which you have to keep in mind please mute yourself while the lecture is going on keep your audio, uh, video off while the class is on so as to maintain the decorum of the academic session we are live on youtube at the rate isa nhq the questions asked by the teacher to the audience can be answered in the chat box and you can post your questions or queries or suggestions in the chat box which will be taken up by the moderator at the end of the session The all the lectures are available at ISA website. So starting from the first zone, we have the central zone coming up, and the topic is ethics in anesthesia clinical practice. The moderators are Dr. K K Arora and Dr. Dipali Valicha, presented by Dr. Muskan. Dr. K K Arora is professor of anesthesiology and vice dean at M J M Medical College Indore. He is he has organized ISACON 2012 as organizing secretary. Organize ISSP Con 2016, Aura Con 2017, MP ISA Con 2019, and Central Zone PG Assembly 2022 as organizing chairman. He has received President Appreciation Award in 2012, Dr. N S Aluwalia Oration Award in 2019, and Certificate of Appreciation from District Administration 2022. He has received the Nine Dunia Chikitsak Award in 2022 and has more than 50 publications to his credit. His area of interest is obstetric anesthesia and ophthalmic anesthesia and pain management. Dr. Dr. Parul, yes, one minute. Just Sorry, to add sir. to that, just to add to that, Dr. K K Arora, if you may not be remembering, he the Indore conference in two thousand twelve. It was one of the best conferences of the decade, if you ask me honestly. So I think we should give a big claps to the Dr. K K Arora sir for holding that conference. That's only for interruption. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Dipali Valicha is assistant professor at MGM Medical College Indore with a teaching experience of six years. She has twelve publications to her credit, and her area of interest is pediatric anesthesia and regional anesthesia. May I request Dr. Uh, Dipika and Dr. K K Arora, sir, to take over the stage and introduce the speaker and the topic. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Dipali Valicha from MG Medical College Indore, and uh, our today's speaker for ethics and anesthesia clinic clinical practice is Dr. Muskan Surana. She is a third year junior resident in our department, and now she will be sharing her slides. Now, I would request Dr. Muskan to please share her screen. Dr. What Muskan, is the, what is the screen name of Muskan? Dr. Muskan. as uh, she is sharing yes she is sharing sir can you make it full screen muskan yes dr muskan your full screen now Dr Muskan you can start your presentation now Uh sir kindly unmute uh, Dr Muskan That's why I'm asking her screen name Dr Muskan can you type it as Dr Muskan Surana May I start, sir? Please, Dr. Muskan. Please start. Ah, uh, good evening, everyone. Myself, Dr. Muskan Surana from MGM Medical College and Mumbai Hospital, Indore. 
I am uh, presenting a seminar on ethics in uh, anesthesia clinical practice under the guidance of Dr. K. K. Arora and Dr. Dipali Valicha. Uh, we are studying this topic under the headings of introduction, goals and principles of medical ethics. First of all, what is medical ethics? It is the application of ethics in the practice uh, to the practice of medicine. It is an inherent and inseparable part of clinical medicine as the physician has an ethical obligation to first of all to benefit the patient, not to harm the patient and respect the values and preferences of the patient. Now in this picture, we can see that morality, ethical principle, professional virtues along with the knowledge and learning skills of the physician together will lead to the patient care. Uh, goals of ethics. The first of all goal is to appreciate the ethical dimension of the patient care, to understand the ethical principles of medical profession, to have a competence in core ethical behavioral skills to know the commonly encountered ethical issues in general and in one's specialty, to have competence in analyzing and resolving ethical problems, to appreciate cultural diversity and its impact on ethics. Now, what are the fundamental principles of ethics? There are four uh, pillars of medical ethics. First is beneficence, second is autonomy, third is non-maleficence, fourth is justice. Now, what is uh, autonomy? It is the respect for individual's right to make their own decision. Whatever the patient wants to be done by on him should be uh, chosen by him only. We should not force the patient what to do and what not to do. Beneficence, the quality of a, uh, doing good. Whatever is the good, good for the patient, we have to choose that. Fidelity, loyalty and promise to an individual. Justice, fair and equal treatment to, for all. Whether the patient is a political leader or a beggar, everyone, every individual should, should be treated equally according to their needs. Non-maleficence, never doing harm to an individual. Culture, uh, culture, morals and religion are the heart of ethics and beneficence and non-maleficence balances each other. That is, beneficence benefits the patient and non-maleficence means that not to harm the patient and social justice is the root of the medical ethics. Now, uh, autonomy. As the picture shows, the desire to be self-directed. Whatever the patient wants to do has to be done and without controlling interferences by others and without personal limitations that prevent meaningful choices such as uh, inadequate information or understanding. Every individual has the right to uh, make their own decision except few uh, individuals that is the infants or in, uh, children and the uh, incompetent patient due to developmental or uh, mental or physical disorder. Now we are taking an example that a 56 year old male lawyer and a smoker, cigarette smoker came to the OPD and a uh, right upper lobe uh, pulmonary mass was seen on the chest radiograph and there is a no other abnormality was seen. The most probable, probable diagnosis which was made was the lung cancer and the physician advised the patient for bronchoscopic biopsy and subsequent resection uh, and the patient understand the whole treatment plan but the patient refuses for the surgery. Uh, all the uh, pros and cons, all the complications and all the benefits of the surgery are, uh, are explained to the patient but still the patient don't want the surgery. So at that point of time, we can't force the patient for, uh, to undergo the surgery and the, we should respect the decision of the patient. Now informed consent, uh, it is the predominant, uh, the predominant medical ethical uh, principle in anesthesia is respect for the patient's autonomy and its expression is informed consent. Informed recent, re, uh, return consent is a legal term that implies an autonomous informed authorization by the patient to undergo a medical or a surgical treatment. The consent should be very clear and in the language which patient understands. 
and it should include all the advantage and disadvantages of the procedure and also it should include uh, the patient should not be forced to, for, to sign the consent and it should be voluntarily and consent to the proposed action now if the patient is above the age of the 18 year the patient can the individual can give the consent for physical examination diagnosis and treatment and the patient should be conscious and mentally sound while giving the consent if the patient's age is between the 12 to 18 years, the patient can give the consent, but just for the general physical examination. Uh, and the patient uh, and the uh, consent of these age groups should be taken from the guardian and the patient should be thoroughly informed about the procedure, what is uh, going to be happen to the patient. Tooth telling. The tooth telling is a very vital component in every relationship even in the patient and physician relationship. Without this component, the physician loses the trust of the patient. Like we can take the example that 45-year-old woman uh, had a total hip replacement surgery under spinal anesthesia with epidural catheter insertion. During the insertion of the epidural catheter, a part of the catheter was broken. And uh, the patient should be informed about this and the patient should be explained that this catheter part of the catheter is inert and there is nothing to be worried right now about it and there is no intervention can be to be done right now and if in future the patient is having any complaint of any spinal nerve compression symptoms or something like paresthesia then only the intervention to be needed but this thing should not be hidden from the patient and should be informed about it. Beneficence, the principle of beneficence is the obligation of physician to act for the benefit of the patient and supports a number of moral rules. Uh, it includes to protect the and defend the right of the others, prevent harm, remove conditions that will cause harm, help persons with disability and rescue persons in danger. The principle of beneficence is just not to ha avoid the harm but also to benefit the patient and promote their welfare. Non-malficence, it is an obligation of a physician not to harm the patient. This simply states that do not cause any pain or suffering to the patient, not to, uh, do not incapacitate, do not cause offense and do not deprive others of the uh, goods of life and do not do something that leads to the death of the patient. Next is uh, justice. Justice is generally interpreted as a fair, equitable an appropriate distribution of healthcare resources determined by justified norms that structure the terms of social cooperation. The, these are the distribution to each person an equal uh, share according to the need, to the effort, contribution, merit and the free market exchange. Let's take an example. There is a 24-year-old female came to the casualty with subdural hematoma with the Glasgow Coma Scale uh, E3, V3, M4 without any comorbidity. And there is also at the same time another patient uh, came to the casualty uh, who is 82-year-old male patient with the subdural hematoma having the GCS of same score that is E3, V3, M4 but with the previous history of stroke along with the hypertension. Now both this patient is uh, are having the same illness but we uh, as at the time of the emergency there are certain time when there is only one ot is free so at that time uh, according to our judgment that we will prefer to take the 24 year old female with a subdural hematoma without any comorbidity but because this patient has a more life expectancy uh, in comparison to the 82 year old male patient and uh, these 24 year old female patient will have a uh, will have the more chances to survive the possible complications now take home message the core of professionalism is the relationship built on competent and compa uh, uh, com compa uh, compassionate care by the physician that meets the expectation and benefits a patient in this relationship which is rooted in the ethical principle of beneficence and non malficence it demands placing the interest of patient above those of physician, setting and maintaining standards of competence and integrity and providing expert advice to society on matters of health. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Muskan. May I request Dr. Dipali to moderate the session to summarize what she has said? Uh, basically, as an anesthetist, we are basically playback singers, but we have our ethical responsibilities and duties towards the patient. And we should, at the same time, respect the decisions and preferences of the patient. We should follow our professional commitments towards the patient and should do no harm, at least minimize the harm caused to the patient. As an anesthetist, it is our responsibility that before taking the case in the perioperative period, in the preoperative period, we should explain all the procedures, available options to the patient and the related complications of those procedures and the possible benefits of each and every procedure and let the patient decide what he wants. We should not impose our decisions on the patient. Uh, care, compassion, sympathy and empathy. It should be weighed against the, our clinical judgment, our clinical assessment in such a way so as to do as uh, so as we don't do any harm to the patient we should not impose our decisions on the patients thank you thank you ma'am and ma'am has very well said that care compassion sympathy and empathy is what is the call of the hour so without wasting much time let's move on to the second zone our second zone now is this e zone And their topic is Ethics in Critical Care and Resuscitation. The moderators for this session are Dr. Bimal Krishan Pandya, Dr. Sapan Kumar Jaina, and Dr. Malay Kumar Patel. Patel and presenter is Dr. Sucharita. Dr. Bimal uh, Krishna Pandey is Professor and Head at VM, VIM SAR Burla. He's Vice President ISA Odisha, and he's the Organizing Secretary of OS ISACON 20, uh, 2011. He has more than 15 pu publications and his area of interest is critical care, pain management, regional anesthesia. Our second moderator is Professor Malek Kumar Patel, who is a professor at VIM SAR Burla. He's a nodal officer of NMC Skill Lab and has more than 10 publications. His area of interest is critical care and regional anesthesia. Our third moderator for the session is Dr. Sapan Kumar Jina, who is assistant professor at the same institute, and he has seven publications. His area of interest is critical care, regional anesthesia, and focus. I request the moderators to take over the session. Introduce the speaker. I request you to please keep up. Charita, you can please share your screen. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Dr. Sapan Kumar Jena from Binsal Burla. From this zone, our student Suchojita Panda will summarize, will present about the ethics in dissertation and critical care. Now I am handing over to Suchojita to present his slides. Yes. Dr. Suchojita, can you please take it full screen? That's better. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Today, my symposium topic is Ethics in Resuscitation and Critical Care, guided by Dr. Sapan Kumar Jena, sir. What is ethics? It is originated from a Greek word ethos, which means moral principles. Medical ethics deliberation is the process of determining what is the right thing to do when considering any Dr. Sucharita, are you encountering any problem? Dr. Sucharita, kindly unmute yourself. Are you able to uh, see your slides? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Medical ethics deliberation is the process of determining what is right things to do when considering any of the dilemmas that arise in medical practice. Medical ethics is governed by four principles of Beauchamp and Childress, that is beneficence, 
नॉन मेलिफिशियंस ऑटोनोमी एंड जस्टिस बेनिफिशियंस इज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ एक्टिंग इन अ वे दैट बेनिफिट द पेशेंट वाइल बैलेंसिंग बैलेंसिंग रिस्क एंड बेनिफिट्स नॉन मेलिफिशियंस इज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ अवॉइडिंग हार्म इन थेरापेटिक एंडवर्स दैट इज डू नॉट हार्म और नो फर्दर हार्म प्रिंसिपल सम हार्म विल कॉमनली टॉलरेटेड कॉमनली टॉलरेटेड वाइल पुटिंग सेंट्रल वेनस कैथेटराइजेशन एंडोट्रकल इंटूबेशन डिफिब्रिलेटरी शॉक विच मे हैव मेनी कॉम्प्लिकेशंस दिस इज बिकॉज कंसिडरेशन ऑफ अदर प्रिंसिपल्स विच टेल्स अस आवर एक्शंस आर राइट रिस्पेक्ट फॉर पेशेंट ऑटोनोमी which was discussed previously it is the right of the patient to accept or refuse treatment yeah. applied to those capable of making decisions it is recognized ethically and legally decisions based on understanding of disease patient's condition nature of treatment alternative therapy risk and benefits coming to justice it is essential balance to the first three principles which apply mainly to the individual justice or the concept of fairness is best addressed by questioning whether there are other who might be adversely affected by a particular action duty to distribute limited health resources equally uh, within a society for example in a mass casualty incident uh, the performance of a hopeless resuscitation may be unjust as it, it deprives other persons with a greater chance of survival of those resuscitation facilities two components of resuscitations are urgency and impaired competence impaired competence is the impaired ability of the patient to make reasonable autonomous decision benefits of resuscitation includes it is a life saving procedure which protects from brain death and restores good health harms of resuscitations are it is uh, it may be unsuccessful unnecessary unkind and unwise uh, unsuccessful when the resuscitation will not produce desired effect because the patient is too sick to perform and harm to the patient is caused by physical discomfort loss of dignity prolongation of death and survival with a decreased quality of life harm to the family member is caused by psychological discomfort of surrogate pain and loss of dignity unfulfilled hope cost of supporting a disabled survivor harm to health workers uh, is caused by frustration sadness guilt of being unable to treat others waiting for resources it may be unnecessary if the patient's condition is not serious enough for resuscitation the harm includes pain discomfort hypotonic illness and unnecessary use of limited resources it may be unwise as it diverts finite resources from alternative healthcare activities that would bring more benefit to other patients it may be unkind because outcome of the resuscitation can make patient or their family unhappy it may be unwanted if it is against the patient's wish consent for resuscitation may be presumed consent or proxy consent presumed consent use uh, a concept that a reasonable patient under similar circumstances would consent for resuscitation proxy consent involves obtaining consent from a family member or other person who can speak on behalf of the patient proxy consent with substituted judgment involves what is proxy things the patient would want done presumed consent using professional substituted judgment resuscitation gather information about the patient to understand how the patient would review this decision bundle consent for specific procedures entails obtaining written consent upon icu admission for specific procedures before the procedure is actually needed ethical concerns being raised about its validity as it is not based on patient's critical circumstances at the time of the procedures the process of bundle consent is paperwork completion at the expense of ethical and legal purposes dnar or do not attempt resuscitation it is a mode of passive euthanasia 
petition for it started from 1994 and honorable supreme court legalized this in 2018 this is cut out from times of india advance directive or living will wishes or expression for end or life care uh, or passive euthanasia based on conversational or written directives periodic consideration needed as patient's desire and conditions may change dnar decision considered when patient with capable mind does not give consent or patient without capacity has given advance directives burden of C when cpr outweighs the benefits how to preserve this dnar it shall be attested by two witnesses and preferably countersigned by a first class judicial magistrate the magistrate shall preserve one hard copy and one soft copy each for and forwarded to the district court registry in january 2023 supreme court made changes in it instead of a first class judicial magistrate uh, attested it can be attested before a notary or a gazetted officer the executor shall inform and hand over a copy of the advance directive to the guardian or close relative who can give proxy consent as well as to the family physician if any a copy shall be handed over to the competent officer nominated from the local government or the municipal corporation or the municipality or panchayat in 2020 icmr expert group on dnar proposed consensus guideline regarding the in instructions decision of taking dnar and shortage of dnar storage of GN dnar forms uh, the hospitals can set up clinical ethics committee or multidisciplinary teams which guide the implementation of dnar when not to start a cpr when there is advance directives by patient or surrogate decision maker valid dnar by attending physician or obvious signs of death like agar mortis or algor mortis is seen or injuries incompatible with life drugs in drugs intoxication hypothermia and ventricular fibrillation we shouldn't stop cpr cpr should be stopped when uh, there is return of spontaneous circulation or the resuscitator is too exhausted to continue or obvious signs of death are present decision to cease resuscitation efforts are often made on a case to case basis systems clinicians the public should consider cardiopulmonary resuscitation as a conditional therapy decisions to withholding and termination of cpr should be taken considering the specific local legal organizational and cultural context criteria that should not alone inform decision making are pupil size cpr duration etco2 value comorbid state initial lactate value and suicide attempt the clinician should clearly document the reason for dnar with this i want to conclude my topic thank you for your patient hearing thank you dr sucharita may i request the moderators to take over and summarize what dr panda has just said thank you ma'am after this presentation we have somehow clear about the dilemma when to do resuscitation or not to do resuscitation but in every scenario we must respect the present autonomy especially in dnar conditions if there is a living will or advance directives and consent for resuscitation can be either presumed or proxy consent which can be given by the surrogate who is either a relative or legal guardian or person taking care of the patient in both the consent with substituted judgment are more important are more because judgment is the anticipated decision by the patient in a sound mind or in his full capacity for example in suicidal patients the decision is not taken in a sound mind so it cannot be considered for dnar and whenever the treating physician is in doubt on whether to perform dnar or not 
CPR should be performed as a as a default option. In case of no advance directive, the decision of the DNAR will be taken by the primary medical board with intimation to the first class judicial magistrate. And the clinician should clearly document the reason for DNAR and the DNAR form is available in the ICMR website which can be downloaded and modified according to hospital protocols or used in hospital set. Lastly, I am thankful to ISA and thankful to Professor Dr. Sukhvinder Prabhajwa sir, Honorary Secretary, Secretary ISA National and our HOD sir, Professor Dr. Bimal Krishna Panda sir for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaina. Uh, would Dr. Bimal would like to add something to it? May I request Dr. Sucharita to stop uh, sharing her screen? We have a few questions in the chat box which will be taken at the end of the session. Thank so the you, next... madam. Yes, sir. Dr. Bimal, sir, please go ahead. <laughs> Nicely presented by them, and uh, no need to further add up to it. Thank they you so much. given justice to the topic. The Thanks dilemmas, uh, I hope uh, the dilemmas which were uh, uh, presented there will solve all the queries. Right, sir. Thank sir, you. so with your permission, we'll continue ahead. Our next zone coming up is. Is the south zone. And the topic is Ethics in Pain Management, Pain Medicine and Palliative Care. The moderator is Dr. Rajesh from Baby Memorial College, Calicut, Kerala. And the presenter is Dr. Rabida. Dr. Rajesh is a consultant anesthetist and academic coordinator for BMH, Calicut, Kerala. He's a life member of IAC, ICA, IMA, ISSP, ISCCM. He has received the COPES Award, is a member of Editorial Board IJ, Kerala ISA Journal, BMH uh, Medical Journal, past academic chair ISA Kerala, member secretary institutional research committee and has 38 publications. Sir, over to you now. Please introduce the speaker and the topic. Thank you, madam. At the outset, I, I would like to thank the ISA National, especially Dr. Bajwa and Dr. Madhuri, Professor Madhuri, for their kind invitation. So that elevating pain is the core ethical uh, ethics in medicine at all levels and today uh, we have Dr. Rabida who is a second year DNB resident speaking on ethics in pain medicine and palliative care. So basically she wants to highlight the importance of alleviating pain and suffering in an and the end of life which is very unfortunately not addressed properly. Over to you Dr. Rabida. Good evening all and my topic for today is ethics in pain medicine and palliative care and I'm starting with a wording by D Dr. Rajagomalan sir who is known as father of palliative care in India. The pain is just the visible part of iceberg of suffering. What is ignored is the part below the surface. It is the feeling of hopelessness and despair, worries about the children, about the money and that is what the palliative care is about. And I'm starting with the four fundamental principles of medical ethics. It's already discussed. I just summarizing in the way of pain and palliative care. They are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. First, autonomy. What is autonomy? The individual is the master of himself. It acknowledges the patient's right to know the diagnosis, his right to know the uh, details of the treatment offered to him, and he has the right to accept or refuse that treatment. If you are advocating me a treatment, I am the one to decide whether I should have it or not. You cannot force any procedure. You cannot force any medicine on me that I choose not to use. Okay. At the same time, the individual can't insist a treatment. He can't say he needs this type of procedure, this type of treatment. Then the beneficence. Beneficence means whatever one does to the patient should be good to the patient. Doing good is our fundamental duty as a doctor and the patient has the right to accept, expect the good or the best from us and we won't do any harm. That is non-maleficence and what we do should be justice. 
But this beneficence and non-maleficence never overweigh the autonomy. The autonomy is always the overriding one. For example, if I am the patient and you are seeing me like I have one, two, three, and these many medical issues and my BP is shooting up and my saturation is falling down and you are advising me in ICU admission and sometimes the ventilator support, but against my wish, against my wish, you have no right to take me to the ICU if I am conscious, if I am conscious. Here come the importance of advanced directive. Advanced directive or living will is a document which state your wishes about what healthcare you want or what healthcare you don't want when you reach a stage in which you cannot speak for yourself. And also you can appoint a person on your behalf to make the decision. Actually, this uh, living will is very useful in preventing the futile or inappropriate treatment and associated suffering and indignity that we are going to face when the life comes to close. So I used the word inappropriate treatment. Then what is an appropriate treatment? What is the duty of a doctor? Do we have a duty to preserve the life at all cost? For example, seven-year-old man with a <clears throat> history of CA colon and he had mites all over the liver and lung. He took multiple cycles of chemotherapy and he is now presented with breathlessness. Should we have a responsibility to put him on the ventilator and making him more and more suffering and prolong his life? Or we should do an appropriate treatment with IV, IV morphine and reduce his suffering and making him more comfortable. According to ICMR, the duty of a doctor is to mitigate the suffering. It is to cure sometimes, relief often, and to comfort always. And they also added, there exists no exception to this rule. That is, no medical ethics forces you to stretch out the dying process. Okay, with our modern technology or advanced technology, it is possible to prolong the dying process with artificial ventilatory support or cardiac supporting system. But here, the biological prospects of the patient should be taken into consideration. First, we should clearly explain the terminal diagnosis or terminal illness to the patient. It may take one or two sittings, but we should clearly explain the diagnosis to the patient. Actually, this truth telling is fundamental to respecting the autonomy. And we should listen. We should listen carefully and listen patiently. How the patient see the situation? And what is his goal? What is his ambition? And what is his wishes about his life? And let him plan his last days. Most of the people in our country express their preference at dying at home. Most of them don't want to stay alone at ICU during their last days. And they don't want to put tubes and catheters into all his anatomical halls and making more and more holes all, all over the body in every day. So considering all this background information, we should apply the ethical principle and we should uh, arrive at decision whether to put him on a ventilator or whether to put him on a life-sustaining treatment or not. Actually, is that euthanasia or is that a passive euthanasia? According to ICMR 2018, there is no word like passive euthanasia. It's a misnomer. The euthanasia can never be a passive process. The euthanasia is a deliberate intervention undertaken with express intention of ending life to relieve the intractable suffering. And they also, that is, here the doctor is doing something intentionally to shorten the life of the patient. And they also added the allowing the natural death by withholding or withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment to limit the harm and suffering in a dying patient should not be considered as euthanasia. In 2023, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of India issued an algorithm for withdrawing the life-sustaining treatment from a terminally ill patient who does not have the advanced directive. The terminal ill patient without an advanced directive, without hope for a cure on prolonged treatment, the treating physician first should inform the hospital. And then this hospital constitutes a primary board. This primary board includes the treating physician and two uh, uh, medical professionals of uh, same specialty of more than five years of experience. And this primary medical board discussed the prognosis for pros and cons of withdrawal with the family physician and the guardian. And this communication, including the consent, is in writing, and the preliminary opinion is given within 48 hours. For withdrawal, a secondary 
medical board visit the patient. The secondary medical board include a, uh, a registered medical practitioner, which is decided by the uh, uh, district and the two medical practitioners of the spe same specialty that belo not belongs to the uh, primary board and with mo more than five years of experience. And they concur with the primary board and the hospital intimate the judicial magistrate first class and the patient proxy within 48 hours. In case there is a disagreement, either the primary board refuses or the secondary board does not concur, the nominee of the patient may move the High Court to withdraw the life support by way of writ petition under Article 226 of the Indian Constitution. Then what is next? The pain and palliative care is more humane and more compassionate alternate, alternative option for this. According to WHO, the pain and palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life, the quality of life of the patient and their families and their families who are facing problems associated with life-threatening illness. It prevents and relieves the suffering through the early identification, impeccable assessment, and the treatment of pain and other problems. Treatment of pain and other problems, including whether the physical problem, psychological problem, social problem, or the spiritual problem. And World Healthcare Assembly 2014 integrates palliative care into all healthcare at all levels, including primary, secondary, and tertiary level, across the continuum of the illness. That is from the diagnosis to the end. That is the pain in palliative care is not only for the end of life care, it actually starts from the uh, time of diagnosis of the terminal illness. Then, what are the problems we are going to face during the uh, pain management, the ethical problem we are going to face during the pain management. Again, the concept of total pain. Total pain is the sum of physical, psychological, spiritual, and social pain. That is pain about the worries about future financial security of the family, pain of anxiety, pain of comorbid disease, and pain, in, pain of fear of unknown. And all this should be taken into consideration. The studies shows that about 47% of time patient uh, suffer from moderate to severe pain during the last month of their life. And studies show about 25% of the dying patient suffer from uncontrollable, unbearable, severe pain during the last week of their life. Why like this? The pitfalls are the failure to identify pain as a priority in the patient care, the failure to establish an adequate physician-patient relationship, insufficient knowledge regarding adequate prescription of analgesics, fear of addiction, and fear of side effect. The first one is the opioid. Opioid has multiple desirable and undesirable side effects. So very good analgesics, but in high dose, it may cause sedation and respiratory depression. Morphine trial is the one of the best methods we can use for uh, uncontrollable pain in case of malignancy and all, but the specialist in palliative care or the anesthesiologist who prescribe the medicine should periodically review the patient. Uh, we cannot deny morphine to the suffering patient by just saying that it causes addition, it causes side effect. Here, the study shows that there is no association between opioid use and mortality in seriously ill population. That is, here the pain acts as a physiological antagonist for the respiratory depression. The problem is that the balancing pain control and alertness, when appropriately dosed, the opioids are unlikely to, unlikely to cause the respiratory depression, but the patient may become sedated and they may become less able to interact with the family and friends. So ask the patient how they prioritize, how they prioritize the pain and alertness. And according to the subject, according to the individual, we should manage it. Then palliative sedation. In some minority of the patient, we can't treat the pain with all these things. So for this intractable pain, uh, we, uh, uh, we give palliative sedation. Actually, it's morally and ethically acceptable. Even if uh, it causes, even if it has done death, and uh, in the consideration of double effect, in the principle of double effect, it is ethically acceptable. The next dilemma we are going to face is religious view. In some religious tradition, there will be there may be specific beliefs and practice related to the death and end of life care. Here, we, uh, the, it impacts the use of opioid and palliative sedation. 
Uh, some may need the mindfulness and mental clarity during their last days for the prayers and all. Here, we should respect that. We should respect the religious be be beliefs of the patient. And in summary, for managing a patient with terminal illness or a manage while managing a patient with severe pain suffering, the compassion and common sense should be combined with professional knowledge and skill in the ethical framework. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravita. You've really explained it very well. May I request Dr. Rajesh to summarize what Dr. Ravita has said and would he like to add something to it? Thank you, Dr. Ravita. It was an excellent presentation. And she has uh, very rightly pointed out that at, at, while treating a patient with uh, terminally ill or in uh, treating a patient in any pain situation, you should hold the four cardinal principles of medicine. And you should also look into the concept of for uh, what is total pain. That's what she has narrated about the Raja Gopal sir's uh, statement in the opening remark. And the dictum in palliative care is to put life into the days rather than putting days into the life that everyone should be uh, should note because our concept is not to prolong um, unnecessary suffering or misery to the patient but to improve the quality of life in the remaining days but as she has said at all stages the patient's autonomy and dignity should be respected and should be given priority and uh, there is a recent Supreme Court judgment. She, uh, it's not a judgment, it's a directive, 2023 directive, which uh, uh, we got from Professor M. R. Rajagopal, sir, which she has uh, shown in the slides and uh, which has clearly shown uh, what uh, the hospital or authorities should do in the event there is no advanced directive from the patient or relatives. So, and uh, another confusion was uh, what about withholding treatment? In a terminally ill patient whom we know that this patient is uh, uh, it's not going to survive or pa patient has in a reversible stage. And Supreme Court has said you can withhold and it is termed as it is not a passive euthanasia. And while treating a patient, it is very, very, very important to establish a good rapport with the patient and relatives, with the patient as well as with the relatives. And uh, you have to listen to the patient. Listening is the most important part in any conversation. And you have to listen properly into the patient. What is his, the psychological element rather than the physical element? What is his financial worries? What is his religious be beliefs? All that should be respected and given due importance into the treatment. So uh, an another confusion which often arises is that whether we can give strong opioids like morphine in a patient which is not uh, of uh, uh, terminally ill rather so like uh, for example in a, so a patient with a sickle cell crisis today itself rabida has given a uh, morphine trial in a patient who is a young girl with a sickle cell crisis and the common belief or a common concern among physicians is that uh, while giving a morphine morphine to a prescribing a morphine to a young patient which is not terminally ill uh, we'll be putting the danger of a patient going for addiction. It is not so. You have to treat the pro uh, pain properly. So we uh, we have given morphine trial and we found that she was uh, got relief with uh, 9.5 or 10.5 milligram of IV morphine. And we have established the nearest oral morphine and converted into uh, today evening. I have seen her and patient is very fine. Patient is pay almost pain free. So uh, it's the what I want to highlight is that we have to educate ourselves, young physicians, especially anesthesiologists, about the importance of giving adequate pain in a patient, especially in a terminally ill patient, holding the cardinal principles of medicine at all levels. I am very happy that uh, so many youngsters have joined the program and actively taking part. And I thank ISA for uh, bringing up this topic, a very important topic. Thank the ISA organizers, uh, uh, Dr. Bajwa, especially for highlighting the topic. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much, sir. So, from the south zone, let's move on to the west zone. And the topic is ethics in organ transplant. And the moderator is Dr. Parna Thakkar, ma'am. And the presenter is Dr. Isha. 
Dr. Parna Thakkar is a senior consultant anesthesiologist and uh, at Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital, Mumbai. She's done her neuroanalysis and research from USA, fellowship in critical care and palliative care. She is a news editor of SAMS. She's secretary of ISA Thane, reviewer for IJA, board member of IHA West Zone, and assistant editor ISA newsletter Vapor. She has more than 150 presentations, lectures, and publication. She's given an oration lecture at Hyderabad World Anesthesia Day 2016. She has won an award for live singing competition at ISCON 2021, and she's a winner of Mary Queen, Mrs. Maharashtra, and Miss Glamorous 2023. May I request Dr. Barna Thakkar to take over, introduce the speaker. And Thank you, Dr. Parul. Uh, today, our third year DNB student, Dr. Isha Maskar from Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital, Mumbai, will be presenting the topic on ethics in organ transplantation. I thank Dr. Bajwa, Dr. Madhuri ma'am and uh, ISA National for this opportunity. Over to you, Isha. Good evening, everyone. My topic for today is ethical considerations in transplant anesthesia. So uh, due to advances in medical sciences now, it has been possible to maintain respiration and circulation in an otherwise brain dead person, which gives us a tremendous opportunity to harvest the organs from these patients. And newer technology along with surgical techniques and tissue typing, along with the introduction of immunosuppressive drugs, has brought about a significant increase in the success rate of transplants. Transplanting kidneys. So the reason why ethics is important in transplant is that transplanting kidneys from living donors of dubious veracity in the West earlier was known as the Bombay procedure because all of this commerce took place openly within the law. There was no law for it. Recently, trading has become illegal after an action of the Transplantation of Human Organs Act in 1994, which made the buying and selling of human organs a culpable offense. The act was brought about by the central government of India to promote legal and ethical organ transplantation across the country in a uniform manner. It was adopted by most of the states and it provided a system of removal, storage and transplantation of human organs for therapeutic purposes, also preventing commercial dealings in the human organs. The act mentions the registration of hospitals performing transplantation, the renewal of registrations and the prerequisites of the same. There are around 26 sections of the THOA Act which further give details regarding the organs and their transplantation. There are four different types of donations, living, disease, tissue, and pediatric. Living donors, so different organs can be given by living and deceased donors. So the living donors can give a lungs, portion of their lungs, kidneys, liver, pancreas, and intestines. The deceased donors along additional to this can also donate their hearts. So the act which was passed in 1994 was recently amended in 2011 and 2014. Some of the recent amendments include inclusion of tissues with organs. Earlier, only organ transplantation was allowed. Now, tissues have also been included with organs. The uh, definition for near relative has been expanded to include grandchildren and grandparents. Before the amendment, only children, parents and siblings were included in this definition. There was a provision made for retrieval centers and their registrations for retrieval of organs from deceased donors. Tissue banks were also registered. There was a provision included for swap donation. There was a provision included for mandatory inquiry from the attendants of potential donors admitted in the ICU and informing them about the option to donate. And if they would consent to donate, then informing the retrieval center. There was a provision made for mandatory transplant coordinator in all the hospitals registered under the act. Also, uh, provisions were provided for higher penalties for trading of organs and to protect the vulnerable and the poor. There was an expansion of the brain death declaration team, which included now a physician, an anesthesiologist, a surgeon and an intensivist in brain death declaration team. Um, national human organ and tissue removal and storage network along with a national registry for transplant were to be established, a provision of advisory committee to aid and advise appropriate authority. Enucleation of corneas was now permitted by a trained technician. Earlier, it was permitted only by an ophthalmologist. And the act has made provision of greater caution in case of minors and foreign nationals along with prohibition of organ donation from mentally challenged people. 
So there was a dilemma in the definition of death, which was cleared in the 2011 amendment. The brainstem death means the stage at which all functions of brainstem have permanently and irreversibly ceased. And the deceased person means a person in whom permanent disappearance of all evidence of life occurs by reason of brainstem or in a cardiopulmonary uh, sense at any time after life birth has taken place. So for this to uh, for this for us to understand this, we must know what is the diagnosis of brain death. So to diagnose a person as a brainstem death, we have the person has to be unconscious and should fail to respond to outside stimulus. The heartbeat and the breathing can be maintained only using a ventilator, and there has to be clear evidence that serious brain damage has occurred, which cannot be cured. The brainstem death certification can be given by a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. However, in rural areas, in the absence of the above two, an anesthesiologist, a physician. or an rmp who is in charge of treating the case can also give the certification of brain stem death so come before we diagnose a person as brain stem death we have to rule out the other conditions like an overdose of drugs or tranquilizers hypothermia and mixed edema coma the diagnosis of brain stem death has to be made by two doctors one of them has to be a senior doctor and neither of the doctors responsible for giving a brain stem death certification can be on the hospital transplant team there are a lot of tests which are carried out to diagnose brain death basically we are uh, searching so that the brain stem reflexes are abolished which include gag reflex corneal reflex pupillary reflex all of these tests have to be carried out two times 6 hours apart and both the doctors have to agree to diagnose a person as a brain stem death the most important of these tests is the apnea test so the apnea test is clinically considered as a confirmatory test for brain death it is a test which is done by clinicians to identify brain stem death to optimize the available resources but however uh, enough counseling has to be done of the patient kin because the apnea test itself can have some adverse effects like cardiac arrhythmias or sudden cardiac Arrest, arrest and hypoxia so the apnea test after the patient is disconnected from the ventilator we have to look for respiratory movements and we have to check for the arterial pacio2 if the pacio2 is more than 60 mm of mercury and if there are no respiratory movements the apnea test is considered positive and the patient is declared as brain death two time apnea test is accepted world over as a class as a confirmatory test for brain death coming to the ethical issues in brain death patients apprehension is there amongst the medical fraternity itself because brain death declaration can be sued as a medical negligence by the patient kin this is one of the major reasons for a less number of declaration despite the patient kin being motivated there is a dilemma in the definition of death there is a dilemma in the time of declaration of death and definitive means of declaration of brain death so coming to cardiac death so cardiac death occurs after brain death has taken place and the period between the two deaths may be minutes to hours to days the relevance of cardiac death and the time needed to wait for cardiac death to occur after the brain death has occurred need to be understood so the resources which are spent to maintain a brain dead patient till cardiac death is has taken place are profound irrespective of what organ we are retrieving or the organ donation brain death declaration has to be done in a regular basis on all hospitals along with a consistent policy and the brain death declaration has to be followed by a cardiac death declaration coming to the rules of the toa that is the toa rules regulations and bodies the functions of the appropriate authority are to grant renew suspend or cancel the registrations of hospitals and to enforce standards that have been prescribed investigate any complaint or breach of any provisions of the act and take appropriate action and inspect tissue banks and hospitals periodically to ensure compliance the functions of the advisory committee which is constituted for a period of 2 years include assisting the appropriate authority in the discharge of its function and a representative from a ngo working in the field of organ or tissue donation has to be present in the committee as anesthesiologist we may be present in all of the following uh, roles so we might be providing anesthesia for transplant surgeries for recipient and donor if applicable we may be a part of the retrieval team in charge of organ procurement we may be a part of assessment evaluation and a perioperative workup of recipient and donor if applicable will which will provide final fitness for the surgery we may be a part of the icu team who is in charge of the declaration of brain death and a part of the auditing committee in charge of renewal or granting of licenses to various hospitals so coming to um, the 
list of various documents which are required there are two various separate sets of documents which are required for a living donor transplant and a deceased donor transplant the most important of these is the form 19 that is the approval letter by the competent authority which gives us a final go ahead for the transplant there are various forms involving medical fitness of the living donor given by the surgeon and the physician psychiatry clearance of the uh, donor and the recipient declaration letter which is given by the nephrologist and the hepatologist a registration paper of the hospital that it is uh, allowed to conduct transplants police verification of the donor and the recipient blood grouping cross matching hla reports viral markers social assessment forms the self declaration by the donor and recipient a spousal relationship uh, other than near relative case uh, in case of spousal relationship, economic uh, background has to be checked of the donor and recipient to make sure that there are no dowry related complications. In case of other than near relative, again, economic background has to be checked to make sure that there are no economic transactions. So all of this is also done in part by the transplant coordinator. The transplant coordinator has been made mandatory under the THOTA rule. Uh, of 2014, which has to be present in every hospital which is licensed to perform a transplant. Coming to the most important topic of transplant tourism, for foreigners who are coming to India for organ transplantation, the uh, procedure is clearly defined in the 2014 amendment of the THOTA Act. The following has to be made mandatory, that is treatment certification from the country of origin as to why a particular donor is being sent to India for donation or recipient. Next of kin has to be available mandatorily during all the interview processes. There has to be a government approved translator to avoid bias and other confounding factors. HLA profiling and DNA fingerprinting is made mandatory in all foreign transplants and economic donor details of both the donor and the recipient have to be made available. Coming to the prerequisites which are given to the cadaveric transplant, before pro proceeding for surgical transplant, clearance has to be obtained from the Zonal Transplant Coordination Center and the ZTCC is responsible for the final clearance given to the patient. The patient cannot directly register with the ZTCC. The patient has to register with the hospital and the hospital will then register the patient to the ZTCC. The ZTCC will appoint two doctors who are present in every hospital transplant committee who are not employed by the hospital. And apart from this, as per the ZTCC, they will also appoint a donor advocate who is an independent doctor who holds a registered medical degree who is again not a part of the transplant team. Coming to my final topic for today, that is the green corridors. So green corridors are basically a route that is demarcated and cleared out for an ambulance which is carrying harvested organs. Because there were many instances where valuable organs were wasted due to a delay in the transportation process. In India, mostly road transport is being used for the shipment of organs. However, if the distance is more, the organs can be transported through a commercial airline as well. Green uh, corridors have been particularly helpful in reducing cold ischemia time, which helps to improve the quality of the organ transplant. And the uh, application for green uh, corridor has to go from the recipient hospital to the nearest police station. Thank you for your time. Dr. Isha, it was a very nice presentation. May I request Dr. Parna to please summarize and add on whatever she thinks is right? Thank you, Isha, for that detailed presentation. Very nice. So, we need to understand that organ trading was very, very rampant in India because there were no laws. So, a law was established to curb this, which is called Transplantation of Human Organs Act, which is THOA Act. It was established in 1994. And the act was amended later on to increase the donor pool because we had very few donors. Then, however, a huge gap still exists between the supply and the demand of the human organs and each organ transplant involves legal, ethical and human rights issues. So, we need to amend the THOA Act further to iron out the grey areas. The number of deaths due to vehicular accidents are now on a rise and if these victims can add to the donor pool, it will help to bridge this huge gap between demand and supply of the organs to some extent. We need to clear the dilemmas about the definition of death in the THOA Act. So as Isha was saying in her presentation that we need to be very, very clear about the definition of death. So the definition of declaration of death consists of brain death followed by the cardiac death. 
so irrespective of the organ donation if we start following the practice of notifying the brain death and the cardiac death timing separately so that once this practice is established this in between time can be used to explain the organ donation to the relatives and the organs can be harvested it will and it will also solve the ethical issues so these patients will also add to the donor pool also in india we need to spread awareness about organ donation in a big way so that it becomes a better established in our country and people start opting for organ donation before death so thank you with that thank you so much ma'am it was wonderful listening to you and uh, as always it's a pleasure to uh, have you on board so can we uh, from uh, west zone let's move on to the last zone that is the northeast zone and uh, uh, the their topic is ethics in obstetric and pediatric anesthesia and the moderator is dr ram p rai we are proud to have dr bk gandhi who is professor and head of sikkim manipal university with us and uh, our next uh, dr anurag can i just uh, show cv of dr uh, ram bahadur rai first and then you can start sharing your screen yes ma'am yeah so dr ram bahadur rai is assistant professor at Sikkim Manipal Univers Institute of Medical Sciences Gangtok and uh, he is uh, passionate about ultrasound guided nerve blocks and he has three publications to his credit so dr anurag over to you and uh, dr uh, ram please introduce your speaker as well as the topic thank you so much good evening everyone myself dr ram assistant professor Sikkim Manipal Institute of Medical Sciences, Gangtok, Sikkim, uh, and we are representing uh, North East Zone, and our topic uh, uh, is uh, ethics in anesthesia and ethics in uh, pediatric uh, uh, patient, um, pediatric anesthesia, uh, and Dr. Uh, Anurag will be uh, uh, presenting this uh, presentation, and I would request. Uh, Dr. Anurag to proceed with the presentation. Thank you, sir. Good evening to all esteemed faculty. Myself, Dr. Anurag, and today the topic given for seminar presentation to us is ethics in obstetric as well as pediatric anesthesia. So here are the contents which we will be going through. That is the introduction, the ethical considerations in obstetric anesthesia, the disclosure to the patient, issues in obstetric cases, the informed consent, the adverse events, and the conclusion. So medical ethics in obstetric anesthesia involve addressing ethical concerns and principles in the field of anesthesia as it relates to patients per se, that is the pregnant woman and their unborn. So obstetric anesthesia is a specialized branch of anesthesia that focuses on providing pain relief and anesthesia services to these patients during labor, delivery and certain medical procedures related to pregnancy. So uh, next is... Now, we, what are the considerations in these cases? So, number one, the considerations would be the autonomy of the patient. So, respecting the autonomy of the pregnant woman is the fundamental ethical principle. This involves providing information about the anesthesia available options and the potential risks they carry, the benefits, and also allowing the women to make the informed decision about her care. Consent processes should be thorough, ensuring that the pregnant woman understands the implications of the anesthesia choices that are available to her. Then there are fetal considerations. So we must balance the needs and of the well-being of the mother as well as that of the fetus because both are the critical aspect of this obstetric anesthesia. So we must also consider the potential effects of the anesthesia on the fetal well-being. Coming to the pain management, adequate pain management is ethical imperative and, the, uh, and we as anesthesiologists should strive to minimize pain and discomfort for the pregnant woman, especially during labor and delivery. So, and we must also understand the different pain relief options and we must make sure that we explain to them the same. That is, which includes regional anesthesia techniques like epidurals and also provide appropriate information to the patient. Informed consent. 
obtaining informed consent is the critical uh, ethical consideration and pregnant women should be fully informed about the risks, the benefits and alternative uh, different anesthesia options that could be given for the same procedure that is being done. In case of emergencies, what we must also be prepared to respond ethically and promptly to protect the life and well-being of both the mother as well as the fetus. So in this case, the communication and collaboration with the other members of the healthcare team, like the obstetricians, the neonatologists are crucial in the emergency situations. And the next thing is the cultural sensitivity. So uh, sometimes our decisions are uh, co confounded by the cultural and the religious beliefs and also for the patient is the same uh, thing. So the anesthesiologist should be sensitive to these factors and we must work collaboratively, uh, collaboratively with the patient and their families to address such cul cul cultural considerations. So uh, what are the basic elements we would like to describe uh, for obstetric anesthesia? That is um, the um, basic elements of uh, this consent is the procedural description. So these are the things which, which are uh, compulsory for obstetric anesthesia consent. So the procedural description, the risk and the benefits, the complications and the alternate therapeutic options. So clinician, clinician's recommendation in a non-coercive manner provides a patient with expert advice as well as reassurance. Although some of the patients, they want full disclosure from our side as to what we are going to do uh, in the procedure and what might happen to them. But the expert opinion and the quotes often tell us that the discussion of only material risk is required and not the entire procedure can be explained in certain time. So these material risks being the potential complications that a patient would consider important for decision making and leaving the room for interpretation. Like although the patient could have uh, arrived to us in a hemorrhagic state, but we do not have ICU beds or we do not have blood transfusion facility available. So these are the things which are material risk for this kind of patient. So these are the things we must definitely share with the patient. So th there are various studies which shows that uh, there were most common complications which occurred in obstetric patients and the uh, litigations and suits which are filed to the anesthetists. So among them, the major common ones were the postdural puncture headache as it's a very common uh, complication followed by the failed block. So that is they were having uh, pain during surgery followed by leg weakness, potentially uh, long motor blockade and uh, backache and a headache. So coming to the ethical issues in such kind of patients. So number one, retention of information during the labor. So suppose during the labor pain, we have asked some history and she is not able to clearly explain to us at that point of time. For example, as she has hidden the NPO status and she is not delineating, delineating it or these some allergies to some drugs which she has not informed us about. So this could be a problem. Number two, the prenatal education and written information. So the use of written materials and antenatal education may improve the consent for obstetric analgesia. So it not only builds rapport, it also elevates anxiety of the patient and they are very well aware of the kind of procedure that we are about to do. The third is the maternal fetal conflict. This kind of conflict is very much common in this, uh, in this patient, obstetric patient, in which the patient autonomy, it must be respected. Nonetheless, if the patient does not want or does not need to, does not uh, agree for our treatment, it could be very much harmful to the fe fetus itself. So which challenges the fetal rights. So some courts, they have decided with the fetal protection and they uphold the court-ordered cesarean delivery in which the court, uh, court provides a uh, order before the uh, procedure so that we can go forward, even though the mother might not be agreeing to consent. So another situation in this which highlights the uh, refusal of blood transfusion. Although the blood transfusion must be very important for the fetus, but the mother, due to some reason, she might not agree to it. So this could lead to, uh, because of a pro personal problems and whatsoever, but this could lead to the uh, grievous consequences for the fetus itself. Followed by that, urgent situations and emergencies. So what happens in these cases that we must focus on the beneficence and the non maleficence as my colleagues have already spoken about and what lies in the best interest of the patient during the treatment. During these times, antenatal discussions may help in assessing the patient's desire. That is, if a multigravid patient comes and she is not able to provide history and it's an emergency case, so we can just ask her if in her past history she has undergone a subarachnoid block and it has undergone, a, it has become, it was an une, uneventful operation. So we can well uh, take that uh, information and we can go ahead with the procedure. Next, coming to the birth plans. Inherent is the ability of the uh, to give consent and the right to revoke it at any time. What this means is that even though a patient has given the consent initially, at any point of time, they might refuse to consent to a certain procedure. And it also has happened that the patient does not consent to the procedure because they might not have misunderstood, uh, they might not have understood it or for the other reasons. But later on, they tell they want to uh, they want to go forward with the procedure. 
So, for example, the patient wanted to go for vaginal del delivery, but she is not uh, counseled well, so she has undergone a cesarean delivery. Similarly, tubal ligation. Even after the OT has started, at the last point of time, she will tell she, she needs to discuss with her uh, husband regarding tubal ligation and for the pregnancy. So, this could also arise. Coming to pregnancy in minors. So, pregnancy itself does not grant legal emancipation. So, these cannot be called as emancipated minors. But it often gives this minor the authority to consent for medical procedures involving her pregnancy and her baby. Otherwise, the consent process should involve the guardian. Even when the guardian is the legal person of the consent, it is advisable to actively include the patient in the discussion and enlist her cooperation. So, that is giving assent. And the next is the anesthesia liabilities. So, some disparities may exist which make the adequacy of consent a potential target for litigation. For example, the consent is taken and signed, but is not clearly well explained to the patient. So this could result in litigation. So this table shows uh, a graph of the obstetric claims and the non-obstetric claims, claims. Earlier, back in the 1970s, the obstetric claims of litigation were mainly maternal death followed by other smaller uh, minor uh, complications like headache, backache, etc. But towards the 1990s and the 2000s, we saw that the most of the complaints that were coming from were because of uh, nerve damage. Followed by that, it was because of maternal death, obviously, and later on, headache, backache, etc. So what are the adverse events you might come across in this kind of patients? So death from an anesthetic. We must... We must delineate this from death under an anesthetic. So death from an anesthetic, so we give a drug overdose or there is a drug error because of some reason. So there is a death which has occurred from an anesthetic. Whereas a death under anesthetic is when a patient is inside the OT, but there are multiple contributing factors like the patient is in shock or you know so certain other cardiac factors, for example, which could com uh, combination of these factors could lead to the arrest or death of the patient. So every death which is happening under anesthesia should be reported to the appropriate authority, including the police. The surgical team along with us will not leave the theater and will not remove anything used for the patient till the police arrives and the and gives the consent to do so. In case of any obscurity or if there is any confusion arising, the surgical team should insist on an autopsy for their own safety. So apart from the consent of the patient, records of history of prior uh, patient like the PAC, which includes history and clinical examination as well as the investigations, should be properly documented at all times. So for operative procedures, the PAC, as you know, the pre-anesthetic checkup is the most important. And uh, any and post-operatively also, any detailed post-operative care or any documents or drugs with that must be chartered. So for labor analgesia, details of the analgesic procedure, record of continuous maternal fetal, as well as any critical events that are occurring should be documented in a concise and a complete manner. So proper documentation is not only invaluable for med medical legal pro purpose, but it also serves as essential form of communication between as healthcare professionals and the patients. I would like to conclude this slide by speaking about the ethical decision, uh, in especially in uh, obstetric anesthesia, requires two uh, important factors to consider. That is the ethical aspects of obstetric care as well as the medical as aspects that could occur. It involves collaboration with other healthcare professionals, especially the obstetrician as well as the pediatrician. These are my uh, information. Uh, these are my bibliography. Thank you. So shortly, I'll be sharing the uh, slide on pediatric anesthesia. Dr. Anurag, are you there? Yes, ma'am. So meanwhile, uh, uh, no, Dr. Anurag, we're not able to see your slides. Please share them. Okay. While Dr. Anurag is uh, trying to start his slides, may we have Dr. Ram who can summarize uh, or can add to what Dr. Anurag has said? Dr. Ram? So um, I think the slides are visible, ma'am. Yeah, you're uh, muted. Dr. Uh, Anurag, your slides are not visible yet. Uh, 
my screen is being shared, ma'am. Your screen is being shared, but we're not able to see your slides. All we can see is the list of uh, the apps and the accessories. Anurag, Anurag, stop sharing and share it again. Okay, sir. Sir, meanwhile, can we take a few questions while he's uh, starting his slides? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so the first question is, and I think it is for Dr. Suchit, uh, Sucharita and Dr. Gina. Can you unmute yourself? The question is, what about CPR and advanced uh, cancer? Dr. Gina? Yes, ma'am. Ah, so the question for you is, what about CPR in advanced cancer? Would in you like to advanced cancer. In advanced, in advanced cancer. cancer. Yes, if, sir. If uh, patient is uh, uh, not willing to do resuscitation, he or she can give uh, a living will or advanced directive. If advanced directive is not there, but CPR has to be started as a default option. Okay. So, is it important to inform the patient who is providing anesthesia that whether the anesthesia will be given by a JR or a senior consultant? It is not necessary. But doctor in, who is giving anesthesia must introduce himself to the patient or um, patient's relatives that I am dealing with you and he, he must be taking the consent from them. Okay. I think Dr. Anurag has able to share his slides. So let's yes, uh, move on to Dr. Anurag first and then we'll start with the discussion. Uh, Dr. Anurag, please proceed. Yes, thank you. So coming to the ethics in pediatric anesthesia, we'll be going for, uh, through the following contents, that is introduction, the key considerations in this age group, the capacity building in minors, the informed consent and some special uh, situation which we encounter with the pediatric patients. So in ethics in pediatrics, uh, it, involves cons it involves considering unique ethical issues and principles that arise when providing anesthesia to children. So pediatric anesthesia, why is it important? Because it's especially due to the vulnerability of the pediatric population, their inability to provide fully informed consent and the potential long-term consequences of medical interventions at a very young age. So the key ethical considerations we would like to come across are the informed consent. Under this, we speak on the two headings, that is parental consent. So in most of the cases, the parents are, are the legal guardians. They provide consent for the uh, pediatric anesthesia. It is crucial to ensure that they are fully informed about the procedure, potential risks, and the alternatives. And the assent. So depending on the child's age and the maturity, a child might be an adolescent and might be intellectually mature enough to understand the... Uh, magnitude of the procedure that he is going to come across. So at this point of time, we have to consider what he thinks about uh, the procedure and whether he would like to go about it or not. Only And we cannot just ignore his uh, decisions and just take over the, with the parent's consent. So the next is the balancing risks and the benefits. So that is an age-specific consideration. As with every child or an every infant or a new unit that is undergoing surgery, there are going to be much more complications to this uh, age group. That is, for example, they are much more prone to hypothermia than hypokalemia and then a lot of other things like fluid loss in comparison to an older child. So the next is the long-term consequences. So for a child who is less than two years, who is undergoing brain development, so if he has to undergo recurrent OTs under general anesthesia, he has to be given anesthesia for longer periods of time, whether this would affect his mental ability and development in the future. So that could also be a uh, uh, risk which comes up. But this has to be balanced with the benefits that we are doing for the child that is performing the OT as an urgency. So coming to the capacity building in minors. So capacity is nothing but the uh, intellectual capability or mental uh, acuity of, for the child during a development. So there are basically uh, four uh, factors which influence the capacity. That is the level of maturity, their educational level and the uh, uh, illness experience and the physical and the emotional state of the child whenever we are taking the uh, capacity consent for him. So should they all fulfill the four steps of capacity? So that is nothing but understanding the broad terms and the, of the proposal treatment, retaining the information for long enough to digest it and then uh, Using it, uh, using it to balance and using it also to make a communicative decision. So the doctor, that is us in this case, we have to assess whether the minor has a capacity. So if we are uncertain, the assessment of the capacity of this child has to be referred to the court. 
while the incompetent minors must have decision made for them in their best interest we must not forget that the best interest encompass medical emotional and other welfare issues not only the best medical outcome for example we need to do a procedure and it could help in uh, the outcome of the patient during the surgery or procedure but we must also think about something common like the financial condition of the patient whether suppose we are going to the procedure whether the patient can afford it or not so these things also have to be taken into consideration so coercing forcing treatment on a child in sometimes case be sufficiently dam uh, sufficiently damaging psychologically and contrary to the best interest and it could so this is called coercing we cannot force treatment onto a child and it could also uh, the child could also be very reluctant to come to the doctor and come for the ot and during the future uh, developing years so that should not be done coming to the informed consent of a pediatric age group patients as for the american academy of pediatrics the pediatric informed consent in is based on the three things assent informed permission and the best interest standards so the informed consent process develops with assent that is the role of the patient although the children cannot legally consent to medical care children should share in decision making to the extent of the development permits so assent as in the the patient develop has a dev, uh, achieves a develop um, this one uh, so, sorry central nervous system is adequately developed so they have appropriate awareness of the nature of his or her condition that is his illness so we tell the patient what he or she can expect with the tests and the treatment that we are about to do so we make a clinical assessment of the patient's understanding of the situation and the factors influencing how he or she is responding to that situation and solicit the expression of the patient willingness and accept the proposed care so informed permission now we speak about informed permission it has the same requirements as that of the informed consent but it recognizes that the doctrine of informed consent cannot apply because we are asking permission from the parents or the legal guardian but not directly from the uh, child to do, perform the uh, ot or the procedure and what is best interest standards it requires decision makers to selective uh, select the objective uh, objectively best care for this kind of patient so it acknowledges that the cornerstone of informed consent that is the right to self determination and it is not applicable when it is impossible to deduce from the child's history or from the child's interactions what a child's likely preference would be if he would be uh, if he would be allowed to choose so who is going to make the decision and what would be the best decision these are the some questions which are very important to be answered pre operatively these are defined by these are defined by choices which fall outside the range of acceptable decision making so criteria to make this determination includes the extent of harm to the child from this kind of information or the harm that could be caused on the absence of our uh, procedure or the likelihood of success and the risk to benefit ratio so informed assent for the school age children and young adolescents so in this uh, age group of 7 to 14 years children should participate in decision making to extent of that their development permits school age children are developed uh, they develop decision making capacity so the anesthesiologist should seek both informed permission from the parent and assent and participatory decision making from the child older school age children so they begin to fully uh, develop fully and flexible enough to understand the motives of the different situations such situations may include to place uh, epidural catheter for a post op patient in a 12 year old so we can simply explain to the 12 to 12 to 13 year old that for your pain purpose we are going to provide you a medication which includes a catheter inside and so and so on and if the patient is uh, assenting and that is i think that is more than enough for uh, going forward with the procedure so coming to a important uh, topic that is emancipated minor what is an emancipated minor some adolescents have legal rights to consent to treatment and these these have the ability to give legal informed consent for all healthcare matters so who are these uh, kind of emancipated minors they are generally adolescents who are already married so they have conceived so that is their parents and then either they are in the military service or they are e economically independent and financially stable and also include may include adolescents who are pregnant mature minors are legally and ethically capable of giving giving informed consent in specific situations as determined by the court so the court allows the emancipated minor to give the consent for the planned procedure the mature minor doctrine generally requires adolescents to be 13 years old and it permits less hazardous decisions at a younger age and of course more hazardous decisions at the adolescents when they uh, reach adultery so this is a uh, table which shows the technique which can which we can uh, practice for children of different age group for example under 7 years old they do not have any decision making capacity so that is none so the, the technique which we use is best interest standards so whatever is for the best uh, the outcome of the patient we are going to go forward with that so for ages of 7 to 13 years they are still developing they they have developed certain capacity so what we can do is we can take a informed permission from the parents and we can uh, get a informed assent from the this uh, child 
The next is the 14 years and older. So they are mostly developed and they are adolescent age group. They are intellectually, mentally, physically uh, well developed. So again, informed assent and informed permission. And then we can go ahead. So what is informed refusal? As with the informed consent and acceptability, we come against uh, we come across refusal in which the requirements to achieve informed refusal procedure, these are very similar to the consent. But the decision makers should be substantially very much well versed about the risks and the benefits before declining such kind of uh, procedure. When parents refuse what clinicians believe is necessary care for the child who cannot participate in the decision making process, clinicians may invoke the best interest standards or incorporate the harm threshold uh, standard. That is, if more harm than uh, good is being done after doing the procedure, then we will not go forward with it. But if it is doing only good for the patient, then we must go forward with it. The situation is more complicated when the child expresses significant decision capacity and refuses non-emergent procedures. For non-emergent procedures, it is okay. We can still take it up in a, a next uh, in the future. But if it is an emergency procedure and the child shows assent, and the child is refusing to give consent, so these kind of situations can arise. In this case, we have to counsel and we have to con convince both the parents as well as the children in a very collaborative and a friendly manner. Anesthesiologists should respect the right of the child that is over the age of 10 years not to assent to a procedure and they should not coerce the child to proceed as we had spoken earlier. Uh, Dr. Anurag, uh, yes, we are running yes, short yes, of time. Can you please join yes, us? Thank you. Okay, ma'am. So I just wanted to speak about the special situations, ma'am, which you come in the pediatric age group. So for adolescents, again, we spoke about adolescents. So in this kind of uh, age group, so if the patients, if we feel that they are uh, mature enough to give the decision, and so we can go forward with their uh, respective permission itself. We do not need to, if it is especially in an emergency situation, we do not need to wait for the parents or wait them to uh, wait for them to decide in such cases. But in uh, regarding this decision, it's very gray zone. So that because the state laws, they have their uh, own discretion on this. So number two, emergency procedures. Again, if the child is, uh, if it's a life-threatening situation, so the doctrine of necessity will protect us. So we need to go forward with the procedure itself. Or else we need to get a uh, written uh, order from the on-call judge that is present and within an hour we can get it done. So if there is a conflict arising between parents, both father and mother are arguing over what we should do regarding the child. So in this, what we have to do is, we have to, the court has to be given the judgment, uh, has, has to be uh, asked for help for giving the judgment and in the minor's best interest, the court is going to act. If there is a conflict between doctors and the parents, so we have to work in a collaborative fashion with the parents or we have to uh, transfer the case to the another anesthesiologist or another center. If some cases of Jehovah witness come where we cannot transfuse blood and blood products for the child and it is very much important for this case, so they must consent beforehand or else we must get a court order even before the procedure starts. If it is a planned elective procedure, if it is an emergency procedure and and then we can speak with the patient at that point of time. And if they are not willing, then we have to uh, respect the patient's autonomy. And then we have to stop with the blood transfusion procedure. If there is a withdrawal of treatment, sometimes it so happens that the doctors are providing uh, treatment and the, there is, uh, it's not uh, suitable to the child's best interest. So at this point of time, we must withdraw and stop all form of treatment. And the impaired parent. So while giving the consent, the parent is intoxicated. At this point of time, what could we do? So we have to weigh the benefits of waiting for the appropriate legal consent against what's in the best interest of the child uh, at that time. So we must uh, document the consent. That is, any anesthetic procedure is there, the consent has to be taken. And all conversation questions lead to affirmation of consent should be recorded accurately in the patient's file. So uh, these are my sources from where I've shared the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anurag. I now invite Dr. Ram to please add to whatever Dr. Anurag has said. Dr. Ram, are you there? Sir, please unmute yourself. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, here we are talking about uh, the ethics uh, in periodic age group patient and in uh, obstetric patients. Uh, why uh, ethics uh, in pediatric age group patients is different from other adult patients is that the first point is that they are not legally eligible to give valid consent. So, but we have to take the consent for any uh, medical or surgical procedure. Then how to take the consent? As uh, Dr. Anurag has explained about the other uh, options like 
some term terminologies like what is assent, what is inform permission from the uh, parents, and what is uh, emancipated minors, and what is Gillick's competent. competent. So it's very important. Uh, uh, so we should be familiar with these terminologies when we talk about the uh, when we conduct the uh, anesthesia in pediatric age group. Another thing is that obstetric patient, which is a uh, 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 bit different from other adult patients physiologically and anatomically. So when we deal with uh, pregnant women with uh, uh, unborn fetus. Uh, especially when uh, this uh, woman presents for emergency cesarean section in severe labor pain, and and when we uh, the conflict con conflict arises uh, between the uh, validity of the consent, and uh, that has been uh, uh, covered. And uh, other another uh, thing is that what are the options for labor pain management? I think he has uh, explained this also. And this should be explained to the patients. What are the risks associated? What are the benefits? And what are the complications associated with this? May I request uh, to, uh, to mute yourself right now while the speakers are speaking? And another thing is that proper do documentation while conducting the anesthesia. Uh, there is a saying, uh, spoken words fly away, whereas written words remain. It's very important to document the consent, whatever, consent, assent, uh, informed permission to avoid the litigation, litigation in the court. Because at any time, we can be dragged into the court if we do any negligence pre-operatively, intraoperatively, and post-op operatively. So it's very uh, important. So uh, there, there should be strong recommendation of proper documentation very operatively. And uh, other thing is that uh, and uh, 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 in our daily practice, we tend to forget, uh, we tend to give less importance to the documentation documentation part. So we should not, we should not uh, uh, Mm. forget this important part of anesthesia conduct. And at last, I would like to thank uh, Bazwa sir for giving me this opportunity uh, uh, in ISA, in this IC session. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I request all the moderators and speakers to unmute yourself because we're going to start with the discussion. Kindly unmute yourself. So there are a few questions which have come up in the chat box. One of the most important questions is, uh, what are the ethical aspects in case of a death on OD table in an elective surgery? Uh, there has been a cardiac arrest intraoperatively. The patient was resuscitated and now has been shifted to the ICU. So what do you do now? Do you How do you inform the uh, attendants? So I think this question can be taken up by uh, Dr. Dipali. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in case of any in inadvertent event in the, inside the OT, if the patient is having a hypovolemic shock, is uh, bleeding, or you are anticipating a cardiac arrest to the patient, you should suddenly inform to the relatives in a sympathetic and empathetic way. The relatives should be informed about the event and the uh, necessary measures to be taken. And if the death on the table occurs, uh, then also the relatives should be, should be informed. The OT environment and uh, the necessary, uh, all the equipments and everything, they should be preserved. Immediately, the police should be informed. A thorough investigation, a post-mortem should be carried out. The hospital authority, the superintendent, they should be informed. Uh, that's it. Very well explained, Dr. Dipali. But the next part of this question, I would like to ask you, most of us, if something like this, a catastrophe like this happens, we generally tend to do is we ask the surgeon to close the surgery or end the surgery and we shift the patient to the ICU. So is it better to announce the death on the table or shift the patient to the ICU and then declare his death? Ma'am, we, usually we do this to avoid the these uh, things, uh, the information to the police and the post-mortem and the agitation that we face from the relatives. 
but if we do it in a proper way there is no harm in declaring the patient dead in ot if we are properly documenting whatever is happening inside the ot whatever is done to the patient if it is properly documented all the records are to be kept there is nothing to worry if you if you haven't done anything wrong usually the practice that happens is ki whenever something occurs we try to resuscitate the patient we yes. uh, have the patient as a uh, when the uh, uh, when the patient resuscitation uh, spontaneous circulation is achieved then well and good and if it is, even if it is not achieved what is done is patient is suddenly uh, the surgeon has asked to close the patient and the patient is shifted to the icu and within a half an hour he or she is declared dead but it patient can be declared dead in ot this is a wrong procedure what i feel is so uh, there is another question uh, dr parul dr parul ji sir, okay. ji, sir. why you want to inform a police every time for these type of deaths when the consent has been taken or the death occurs on the ot why a post mortem for everything why we are creating a mistrust among the public to involve the police in every death on the table like that or shifting to icu that is going to create a lot of mistrust in the minds of everyone see your social structure see your setup see the intellectual sense of the people around you see so many things are there why you are inviting troubles for yourself medical practice is not just a thing of theory it is a practice you are doing for the betterment of the patients for the betterment of your staff for the betterment of humanity why you are involving police you know involving police means that you have done something criminally offensive on the table which you were not supposed to do that is not fair to involve police in these type of cases to go for the post mortem these are the things the therapeutic misadventures do occur on the table you have taken consent for the coma bit condition if something happens on the table i think it's the type of the communication sent by the doctor on duty the person who is attending the patient how the person communicates with the relatives because see we are giving everything in a good will way to the patient relative to the patient we are not doing any criminal offense we are treating the patient if something happens that is labeled as a therapeutic misadventure in the forensic sciences these type of things ha huh? if negligence is there definitely there can be a certain question but even then also considering the trust already the society has lost a lot of trust on the medical specialty and the government is also not helping you other with the policies so i don't think so you have to land up into these thing to create more mistrust lowering more dignity of the doctors and you know exposing the public what is the public here how much intellectual sense how much literary level they have got how much thinking is going you just uh, expose one medico they will be after the blood of everyone this is not a fair in our society our society is not that highly educated society where you can expect justice for the doctor so in these type of cases mm-hmm. it's the wisdom of the attending anesthesiologist to see what is happening how it happened how it can be tackled how to a surgical team to be taken into confidence how the paramedical staff in the operation theater to be taken into the confidence how to convey to the relatives what can be the possible things police going to the police is the last resort you should see how the things should be smooth for your operation theater for your institution or hospital and for everyone because there are will be more patient in the hospital there will be more at relatives will be, everybody is going to get panic if any death occurs that means you are doing it for something good but you are creating a panic in the minds of the other people you are creating a mistrust in the mind of other people this is not the right approach right approach is the best she is right empathetic and sympathetic communication but these comes over a year the learning curve comes over years so yes. when the death occurs on the table you know our psychological bent of mind is a death on a table means operation ke time pe death ho gayi ye operation galat hua this is the common belief in the persons in the people in the society in this type of scenario what you are do- going to do see it's not your fault it's not a surgeon's fault suppose these things happen i think we have to see everything in the whatever we can do best for the safety of the patient we should keep on resuscitating i think the best way of resuscitating in the icu where you can have a psychological physical clinical so many protections there also so you can work in a very good atmosphere to resuscitate the patient also i think declaring death on table is good if the patient is having some emergency surgery patient is having some you know untoward incidents because of the pathology with which the patient presented but still then i think going to police for every death is not a solution to these things 
it's up to the wisdom of the tending anesthesiologist to deal the matter then and there only. I think we have to see our societal setup also, not just the clinical setup also, the type of protection you are going, uh, going to be uh, given. Because, you know, every relative is different, every patient is different, and every hospital is different. So these have to be done on individual to individual basis, rather than just having a blanket, you know, thinking for one only one case. That's my take on these type of things. Mm, very well said, sir. And... Uh... As usual, pearls of wisdom from you. So do you think it is very important that the surgeon and the anesthetist are also on the same page and they have a good communication between them too in case if such an incident happen? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. See, uh, the teams, you don't consider it's anesthesiologist for surgeon's fault. Whenever the doctors are doing, suppose there are chances <laughs> that death, death occurs because of some, you know, uh, unnatural circumstances or do negligence. Negligence is not tolerable. Negligence is not tolerable. I don't think so. If your surgeon does a negligence or an anesthetist does a negligence, nobody can be a team, I'm telling you. Nobody will be a team. It's only when the negligence is not there, death occurs, then the team effort can be there. Otherwise, if the negligence is there, the surgeon, if the anesthetist has done a negligence, surgeon will try to incriminate the anesthetist. If the surgeon has done the negligence, Anesthetist will be putting the negligence on the surgeon. So those things are like, only when there is a death due to unseen circumstances. Okay, fine. Going by the law, go. You can go to the police station or go, you can complain to the police station for the post mortem some unnatural death occurs, which is beyond your thinking also. Then it's fine. But I think every case has to be individualized. We should not be following the same orders, same protocols for every death on the OT. That's what my take on this type of thing. Right. Sir, shall I add something? Sir, shall I add something Dr. to this? Dr. Kimmel, Dr. Kimmel, sir, please. 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 Yeah. Sir, uh, there had been uh, two, three incidences in our state. Uh, despite the Supreme Court has ordered that uh, for any negligence, a team of doctors has to uh, ascertain that there is a negligence, then only the doctor can be taken into custody. But uh, uh, one of our entities, was kept in the uh, hajat for around uh, nine hours. And another has to flee the area because the patients are very unruly. So uh, how to disprove that medical negligence has not been done? So uh, the procedure says that uh, we have to inform the police and we have to keep uh, uh, um, everything intact, whatever is there, even all the drugs, all the ampules. So that uh, it can be investigated that we have not done anything. So uh, we should come up with certain guidelines or we must request uh, the court the similar way uh, that uh, negligence uh, has to be ascertained by a team of doctors. Similar uh, methods should be there whenever a death occurs. Instead of uh, the guideline saying going to police, if other method is devised, it will be better for our society. Sir, I will tell you one thing now. It's a normal thing. We always keep preserve everything about the MPUs or about the visra or whatever it is there. We keep everything. Now, team of doctors, you choose any team of doctors from anywhere in India. It's a common thing that doctors will not incriminate the doctors. 99% cases, they will not incriminate those things. Everybody knows that also. Regarding the unruly behavior, regarding the safety of a doctor is very, very important in yes. present day circumstances. Yeah. Their society is not respecting you to like a god. They are saying you are a professional, you are earning money from our, uh, you know, treatment. So you are ought to be, you know, a, we are a consumer. So you have to give us everything. So those things are beyond discussion in this type of forum. But if you see the amount of uh, energy being uh, spent by your doctor in that operation theater, whether a surgeon or a anesthetist, you the all type of catecholamine secretion goes exhaust. You get exhausted. When you are doing this, you are doing the best yes, thing. Sir. That the is the thing. reason why yeah. we, we are wary of declaring death on table. We, yeah. we try to fit the patient to ICU so that, uh, that 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 way we have devised. Sir, and it's not happening in India. I'm telling you, if you ask me, there are reports, there are incidences which have come purposefully from the data from the Western countries also. Even these people are also very much afraid of declaring death on OT. They always go to the ICU to resuscitate the patient to show these things. Only thing is that how much of the data we really present to the general public. 
whether it's India, whether it's America or Europe, anywhere, sir, the scenario is almost same for every doctor, every clinician who is dealing with the life-threatening surgeries or something like that. So the ideal thing is that we do all the things, whatever is required for the inquiry. This is a very important topic. That's why this symposium is there. Yes. Yes, but sir, yes, I yes. think even the court knows the doctors are, if the committee is formed, no doctor can ever be incriminated. Similarly, the politicians, if they get caught in a scam, no politician will ever get a jail, hardly one or two percent. <laughs> so same thing everywhere. So those things are useless. So best I think is that we do our best in an honest manner. You try to be on an individual basis, seeing the intellectual uh, level of the patient relatives, see the ferocity, see the things, individualize the things, protect yourself. The say in plain, nah. yeah. in plain, first yeah. talk that, that's, that's, you that's... before you protect others. So because if you protect yourself, you will be able to protect many patients. But because nowadays the mental setup of the peoples are very, very different. And we should go practically rather than theoretically in these type of things. What are the guidelines? There are no guidelines. The guidelines given by the court, guidelines given by the other people are framed by whom? Are framed by the non-medicals. Are we, uh, because every time in the CPR or in the CP, and all the consumer cases, we are incriminated everywhere. That's why the discussion is very important. The individual part is very important. If we go theoretically, we will always be at a loss. We will always be at a loss. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question by Dr. Sumati. She would like to ask the house, is it ethical to practice intubation in a dead body in ICU? We have to respect the dead body. Whether in a living or dead, we have to respect. So uh, it is not wise. It has been a practice in many places. Whenever we get a dead body or a dead fetus, we, we use it. Uh, as as previously, we are uh, not having so many good mannequins. Now, uh, that is a reality that we are having mannequins. So, when we have a mannequin, then the uh, practice of uh, doing it, the junior residents, uh, we used to uh, give them a practice session uh, on a fresh uh, dead body. That, because uh, it will simulate. Now, as we have simulators, I think uh, we don't need to do that practice anymore. And moreover, see, in a dead body, everything is relaxed. All the difficult airway algorithms go into failure. Why are you practicing on the dead body? It's not useful when it comes to the live body intubation. You are going to get more challenging situation. When the mannequins are definitely Dr. Bimal is right. Mannequins are there. The skill labs are there. Everything is there nowadays. So I don't think so. We require those type of things. Right. I think respecting the dignity of the dead body is very important. Very Agree important. With you. So what is the role of consent in perimortem cesarean section? Dr. Anurag, would you like to take this question? You've answered it nicely in chat box, but I think you should take it here also. Ma'am, since if it is a emergency case, and if the patient has arrested, so as I had spoken about, so we will follow the protocol of ACLS, ma'am, and which includes informing the patient party Immediately at that point of time, the arrest has occurred. Because it's an emergency, we wouldn't have got time to explain prior to the uh, OT that these are the risks and the higher risks which could uh, the patient undergo and these things, ma'am. So if that is the case. But if it is a planned case and, and then undue event has happened in inadvertently and this uh, case has happened, then again, we will follow the perimortem series that is within five minutes. We will deliver. We have to deliver the baby, ma'am, and then followed by that, we have to again follow the ACS protocol. And at that point of time itself only, ma'am, I believe that we should. Uh, we have to inform the patient that these are the things that has happened without hiding any information as to, uh, like uh, you know, what has happened inside, ma'am. Good. So, does the fetus have rights before birth, ma'am? So, the fundamental right of life. Uh, so that is always there, ma'am. But uh, per se, I haven't read regarding the fetal rights, ma'am, which is uh, there. Which Dr. Narag, Dr. Narag, see, see, see the clauses of abortion. Every fetus has got a right. Every yes. fetus has a, got a right. You have to take a permission to abort the baby. You cannot do. So that means the right has come from the government only. Every fetus has the right in our society. That's yes, why the ma abortion laws have been made. Okay. Yes, because yes, when you are already see when the UPT come positive, the patient is pregnant. That's the same day the fetus started living. When you come yes, to sir. know, he has a right to come to this level, the world. He has a right. Uh, Dr. Paru, yes, Dr. Raghunandan has raised hand for yes, a long sir. time. Yes, sir. I was just about to ask, sir, to say something. Dr. Raghunandan, sir, please unmute yourself. 
Yeah, ma'am. Uh, good evening, you. everybody, sir. Sir, uh, regarding the skill lab, now the first year MBBS students are being thought about how to do AHA, ACLS, and BLS. From the first year itself, you are starting. As I am the skill lab in charge, uh, member uh, secretary of both the colleges of our SAHE, I would like to express that skills of uh, ACLS and BLS are being taught. Even now, we are incorporating uh, advanced trauma life support also into this. Uh, that is one point. The other point is, sir, I don't agree with the people like a uh, registered medical practitioner is able to declare brain dead. As brain dead scenario, we have a few people who are going to be the part of it where the team includes a neurosurgeon. As you know, as the presenter has already told, uh, there was one point which uh, I deferred because a registered medical practitioners, I don't think, will be the right person to tell whether the person is brain dead. It is always to have the norms followed by the uh, laid out by the central government. And the Supreme Court has clearly mentioned that brain dead scenario has to be has to be a teamwork, and it is not a one person who can declare a registered medical practitioner cannot declare brain dead. And coming to the organ donation scenario, sir, I've been working as NODAC chairman of uh, Karnataka since two years. Uh, I have come across many organ donations program. I've done my organ donation, which was covered in the ISA uh, journal also. Uh, we have been doing like. Uh, the right from the time of the pa patient being declared in, as brain dead to retrieval of uh, organs by giving anesthesia to the organ transplant or uh, let it be cadaver transplant. There is always a thin line where we have to emotionally, we have to take the patient's attenders into confidence, which plays a very thin role as an intensivist. I have faced this many a time. There people try to, uh, there is an emotional factor which is attached to their uh, human beings, uh, parts being detached from the body. But many of the people feel like, oh, my son or my husband is going to live in somebody's uh, uh, body and he's going to give a life to the other person. That kind of great nature of uh, uh, organ donation, uh, this thing should be imbibed. So I think we as uh, anesthetists, we also should play a part in creating public awareness, sir. I am for public awareness. I've been doing national uh, organ donation programs, awareness pro campaigns since four years. And now uh, I've been on, also asked to come to our uh, NOTO for giving a presentation for what work we have been done. So I, I request all the anesthetists, since this is the ethical uh, committee and ethical points are being discussed, even the uh, supportive character and the, even the what an anesthetist can do by doing uh, service to the uh, society is also, organ donation is also one of the things. Thank you for your uh, time, sir. That's it. Thank it you so much, Dr. Dr. Raghunandan, sir. Dr. Uh, Paru, Dr. Kishore Roda wants to say something. Dr. Kishore, yes, sir. unmute yourself and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Bajwa. And yes. Good evening. Yeah, I want to tell you that most of the time, because there, is, there are a number of attendants, we cannot convince them. Means if with communication and with proper convince, they are convinced then it's okay. But otherwise, death on table is very difficult to manage. Yeah, because, because there will be agitation and and, and, and in no time in the um, uh, era of social media, 25, 50, 100 people come and it's very difficult to manage. So, so uh, that's why better to declare in ICU after one hour, two hour, oh, if if you if it is at all to be declared on table, then I think we should uh, we should be ready to inform the police and uh, oh, that's true, to, sir. To, that's to deal with the, 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 this situation. That's yeah. what I said also, sir. Absolutely true because you know it's very difficult nowadays to handle the things because yeah. the temperament and the you know the attitude yeah. of the public is not that uh, medico friendly. Yeah, yeah. We're very yeah. honest. We 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 can't we can't ignore these type of facts. You know, yeah, yeah. we can't be just having a moral science for the doctors only and the rest of society not adhering to any moral things. So I think we have to be very, uh, uh, you know, somehow practical. I, I think practical, more practical. Pra practically, we have to think on it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, agree, agree you with you, sir. Agree with you. Yeah. Dr. Parna, um, you want? Yeah, and uh, Dr. Parna and, and would like to add something. 
and thanks for appreciation and remembering still is a gun to zero are sir that thanks. was a wonderful conference i know that yeah, conference yeah. i know how you did it and it was wonderful everything was good about that yeah, yeah. thank you thank you very much thank you thank yeah. you very much yeah so dr parna you wanted to add something to it ma'am yes sir uh, so i agree with dr kishore because uh, i personally feel that any death on table especially in the emr era like where electronic medical recording system is there in our ods and we are you know supposing if there's a death obviously before the death there'll be hypotension some hypoxia something may be there which may be later on interpreted as you know negligence so i think it's always better to shift the patient to the icu and inform and most of the times post mortem also occurs in these patients uh, because uh, any death within 24 hours of the surgery post mortem may happen so it's always better to inform the police and declare the death in the icu i personally feel that way right ma'am so our next question is can assent be written as well and what age group can give a written uh, assent dr anurag or dr ram i uh, dr parul written can be given by a 5 year old kid also in the presence of parents that's not a problem it's a problem independent independent consent about the awareness of his bodily rights about his own rights that is more important as a if you ask the question in a right frame of manner that's right. what i wanted to ask he is independent written assent is valid and what age group can give it i think uh, we have got a voting right isn't it 18 age 18 years adult age in india so it it varies from place to place i think for india i think it's 18 18 above you have all the rights of adults so you can always give a consent although the person is very much competent to give any type of uh, consent but i think is always better for a medical legal purpose also that to involve the parents if the child is not has attained the age of uh, you know seniority 18 years i think that is my take on this type of thing to be practically safe in all these type of surgeries sir but sometimes when we do theses or when sometime we do research papers sure. uh, we take the assent of the kids who are like uh, 12 or um, 12 year or more so uh, i, I did not understand you should take you should take, you should take, the, you should take the parents also parents also not of the kids parents also you are doing rather it's more important the research is more important than the normal surgeries so i think it become more prudent to take at that time for the parents you should involve the parents right sir Dr. Sukhdev Naik, sir, you wanted to add something to this. Kindly unmute yourself, sir. Unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, sir. This is about the previous uh, about uh, taking the shift. Uh, Prana, uh, Dr. Prana told that uh, we we'll should shift to the uh, the the DOT. We should shift to the ICU. I have but one doubt uh, uh, in uh, because we will we'll be ethical to. West the uh, expenses of I should once we have got all the recordings all the EMR everything is explained to the patient the happening or the how the patient goes down gradually we inform the patient that there is something serious or some we may have to some problem so if it is everything is explained and we have got all the records with us to defend us why should we shift again to the ICU and West another bed in the ICU and all these things is my to to me I think I don't practice it I always explain. if something happens of something deteriorating and we are going to lose i we always see to the patients and we don't we declare on the the um, death on the in the ot premises itself to another room and we shift we allow the uh, family to sit down and we don't shift to the icu because i don't want to waste say even half an hour one hour or whatever uh, there is a blare or something so there is difficult uh, uh, logistically so we don't uh, we we declare in the theater in we received to another side room post up uh, side and we do that i don't know i say <laughs> that is what we practice uh, dr bajwan others will give enlighten us dr sukhdev sir what i what i will say i will tell here now in your ot you are declaring a death i think the best person should declare a death is a surgeon the Can surgeon he declare the death on your behalf no listen to me now i'm saying now something different now coming to that part the death has caused due to negligence of a anesthetist who had never shown a face to the patient patient never went for the pre operative examination properly to the person because the psc is done by third year pg student in the psc room and the anesthetist is a different in the operation room 
and suddenly a, a person who has never met the relative and come to the relative say your patient is that see that is something important because this is a very very different scenario that's what i said intellectual level of the patient each and every patient has to be individualized how much they can understand you how much they can understand the scenario how much they can understand the mentality how can, much they can understand your efforts how much they can understand your honesty those are very different factors you are working in institution i'm talking about the clinics and the practitioners in the uh, multi uh, this one hospital the institutions are always immune they are protected by the atmosphere the environment of the institution the policies of the institution the security staff there but if you talk about the periphery talk about the multi specialty hospitals wherever things are going especially the private people are different people take things differently and i think sending a message to declare to become a too much adventurous on those things it can be harmful for our own fraternity where you are once we are talking about the awareness about the anesthesiologist people are not aware 90% of the people are not aware about who is the anesthesiologist they only know the surgeon and here anesthesiologists want to become a hero in front to say your patient is dead what are you going to expect from a patient relative they say who is doctor where is he come from we are meeting that surgeon surgeon is sitting uh, standing behind is not seeing anything that's some telling you the team work has to be there the repo has to be built things have to be dealt in a individualized manner wherever patient to patient based upon their what i will you call the intellectual level their social setup your own setup your own clinical setup and your own safety i'm telling you this is a practical thing theoretically i say you declare everything on the table become a hero and see you are you are misquoting me you are misquoting no, no, i not, not i, I, I never said i'm not misquoting you i'm telling you I the know, fact i never said That's on the reality, table reality reality i never India. said on the table i never said on the table we always shift to the another side room and do there you are misquoting side room or sir side room or i do the same and, thing and the entire team is there sir sir everybody is there sir side room means I what side room means personal experience i never i never i told I, it's up to you to side room means what side room with monitors and resuscitation no 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 hamara no. uh, first time alag hota hai kabhi kabhi death ko we sir, before you may be having but the... not entire india may be having that side of a setup no no i i told my talking about sir my... talking about a general for everyone here no i told my my humble submission that we do no, no, it's okay sir okay once you, you once you say that there is institution isu isu ka to hota hona hai chahiye protection hota hai and that is required sir sir we have to work for the no, awareness no, no. about anesthesiology that's my, very my important my point was my point was not wasting the isu time sir it's not about wasting isu time it's about the saving the life of your own doctors i'm telling you doctors have been beaten brutally by the uh, relatives even a minor incident happening outside people don't spare the doctors nowadays neither surgeon nor anesthesiologist you see the incidents every day sir every month you get one or two incidents like that that's because the anesthesiologist that's because the anesthesia never met the patients or the relatives before that's why that's ah. what i'm saying ah. so can we move on heroes. okay okay thank you so can we move on to the next question sir, we are moving uh, on already uh, sir bajaj sir there's this question is actually for you Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Sureka wants uh, you to please uh, say something about writing a death certificate by anesthetist in OT. Death certificate in OT. I think uh, that is a little tricky question. Death certificate actually has to be because the surgery is undertaken by the surgeon. The patient is admitted under the surgeon. Your death certificate will not be a valid testament in the court of law because. is so if you are in the icu the patient in icu you can write but in a, as a nsts in the ot if the death occurs by the surgical negligence how can you verify it how can you validate it it's a difficult it should be written by both the surgeon and the anesthesiologist in the operation theater if you want to declare the death there but if in the icu you can take charge to declare the death and then and there in icu otherwise in the ot nobody single should uh, person should write you act like a team act like a team and give both should own the responsibility i think that's my so dr, dr. raghunandan would like to ask some questions about declaring brain dead and motivation of the family to organ donation he is right so, actually he raised the question i read in the chat box Jesus. because uh, brain dead has to be declared by the specialist you have got a certain parameters to be noted 
how the brain behaves when the brain is dead. You how, see the reflexes. You see the monitoring standards. RMP cannot declare a person brain dead. Nobody That's can. Okay. You have to ha declare by the specialist. If you say MBBS person is declaring a brain death, okay, that can be taken, but that's not even, a, you know, uh, some uh, specialist come say, have you checked these type of things? So if a specialist declaring a brain intensivist, a neurologist, these type of people, if they're declaring a brain death, there is no second question about that. Right, sir. Uh, so what are the ethical rights? Of, this is for the house. Um, would like to know what is the right of the fetus? For the research purposes, what is the right of the pediatric patients for uh, research purposes? Fetus right is the same right what a pediatric patient has got. The same rights. No difference among the rights when the life has already been born in the fetus, maybe in utero, in utero or ex utero. The life, the rights are same. You have to respect the rights of a, any life in our country. That's true. So you can't. I think I am I'm filling the part of the sixth zone, north zone. There was a person yes, absent sir. in the north zone, so I, I think I have taken that time to answer those things. Right, sir. So, uh, there are no more questions in the chat box, but we have some wise uh, moderators who would like to add something. Uh, can we have the moderators uh, unmute themselves and would they like to add to something? Uh, regarding, uh, regarding rights of the fetus, no, previously uh, the MTP Act which was 12 weeks and 20 weeks. Sir, unmute. You have become muted. Dr. Bimal, uh, sir, please unmute yourself. Am I audible? Yes, yeah, sir, you are audible, audible, sir. So, uh, um, previously it was up to uh, 20 weeks. Then it was relaxed up to 24 weeks. Now uh, it has been relaxed further. And uh, because uh, certain cases like NN Kefali and uh, all those cases cannot uh, independently uh, leave ex utero, they, there will be a team consisting of an anesthesiologist, gynecologist, pediatrician, and a radiologist. Because they, they uh, we all are involved in the management of uh, pregnancy. So if they can opine at any point of time, uh, whether it is 36 weeks or 34 weeks or 34, uh, 3 weeks, the pregnancy can be terminated. Yeah, too, sir. Those are actually special circumstances. Rest uh, things are same. Only in the special circumstances... Oh, I, I, just, I just added... I, uh, yeah, this yeah. is just to add... Whatever yeah, you have said is correct. I just added it that uh, uh, life uh, ex utero because uh, the rights of the fetus is there. If... The fetus will not be viable ex utero. Then the provision to it is just like a euthanasia, a passive euthanasia, which we were we were discussing previously. So they have extended it to uh, the uterus uh, to fetus, uh, which cannot due to some congenital anomalies cannot live independently ex utero, which was a burden to the family. So Supreme Court uh, previously there were many cases which were lingering or MTP. So it has relaxed. And it has given, uh, that is the reason why I was telling regarding death on table to have a uh, consensus opinion with a team of doctors. Because here also for MTP, uh, and, uh, two uh, gynecologists were required to perform it after 12 weeks. It stayed for an, an, another 50 years, but now they have relaxed it. And uh, two, two gynecologists will perform, but decision will be taken by a radiologist, a anesthesiologist, a, a gynecologist and a pediatrician and a medicine because uh, and the most sir, most important decision should be taken by the mother. That's the most important. What she wants, sir, because she has to be told proper sir, decision sir, has to be taken sir, by sir, mother first, then the other people will come into play. Sir, this comes only after the parents' uh, request for the uh, termination. Especially mother, sir, because she you know she will be with the okay, trauma. Okay, because sir. having a pregnancy okay. for so many weeks, I think Three the father sense. may not be having that trauma. Yes. Mother is going sir, under sir, sir, trauma. So obviously, obviously. Mother uh, is, is the first person. Sir, Dr. Kishore Aroda, sir, you wanted to add something to it? No. Kindly unmute yourself, sir. No. No, no you conveyed it. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Rajesh, I want to hear from your side. I haven't, you know, heard from you for a long time. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion. 
and a very relevant topic, especially for the postgraduates. And a uh, uh, couple of things uh, about the uh, rights of the fetus and the mother, they are considered in biomedical research, they are considered as vulnerable population in the ethics committee point of view. And the ethics committee very strictly scrutinize whether the procedures are as laid down by the ethical committees followed in the biomedical research. That's one comment. And another thing about the um, death on table, any death on an anesthesia death on table is considered as a medical legal uh, case. And uh, it has to be informed. Uh, um, uh, we have to be very straightforward and we have to be honest to the bystanders that such and such thing has happened. And uh, if the bystanders uh, doesn't want uh, autopsy, we can uh, directly hand over the body. And uh, a few instances, uh, it is very important to uh, take a video consent with the bystanders, especially when you are dealing with a very high risk patient. As far as the legal point of view, only for solid organ transplant, it is required. But some of the institutions do take video consultation even for high risk patients. There are my few comments. Thank you, Dr. Bajwa. Yeah, I forgot to add the video consent, which I usually take every time. So that Thank I you. forgot to add here. Because it's a routine for me to take a video consent now. Because without for all, video, all patients? Yeah, all patients. Even oh, in ICU, every patient I take a video consent. Oh, that's a, uh, As far as the legal format, it is only required for uh, for solid uh, order. You don't know, no, sir. Because these days, you know, better yeah. to be on the safer side. Uh, take a video consent because patient can come later on. I, I will tell you a story when we meet alone to discuss because it doesn't look nice to discuss on this platform. There are stories about it also with the colleagues and friends also. So this was a, actually a very, very interesting topic. It is a one day CME actually and the discussions can go on. So sir, uh, can we have some concluding remarks from you? And uh, Madhuri ma'am, would you like to add something to it too? No, Parul, I do not want to add anything. I think everything has been covered. Right, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So that's a wonderful discussion. Yes, sir. Just one uh, uh, question from me to Anurag. Uh, Dr. Anurag, I particularly liked your uh, presentation. Anurag, Dr. Anurag is here, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Yeah, you know, you were mentioning about the decision-making capacity in children. But yes, sir. Many times, like what we face is the decision making capacity assessment in the elderly. We don't have any parents to fall back to. So, yes, sir. There, uh, how, how can we go about uh, assessing the decision making capacity in adults, uh, yeah, elderly, particularly if they have Alzheimer's or something? Is there any uh, uh, guideline or something for that for us? Sir, uh, regarding the elderly geriatric population, I am not very much well aware regarding it, sir. But uh, I can just only opine that if I would be there, sir, I would have taken a psychiatric consent initially to assess the cognitive impairment. So, so daily day-to-day -day needs and these things, if they are not able to perform, then certainly they cannot give the consent, sir. So I would be taking the psychiatrist opinion, sir, in this case. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Nurag, I think rather than going to the psychiatric or a, a psychologist, I think first of all, have to take their son or a daughter or maybe grandson or a daughter into a good confidence. You yes, take sir. them into confidence and then think, I think, proceed wherever because once you get a confidence of their grandsons or their sons or daughters, I think thing, life yes, become sir. much easier. Life become much easier yes, to sir. go for any further consent or intervention in geriatric patients. Yes, sir. So, sir, conclude from you, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone. I just have to thank everyone because these are the topics which are always uh, full of controversies, full of, you know, uh, double angles from this saying, one person saying this thing, other person saying that thing. And uh, opinions may vary from uh, person to person, but ultimately we have to work for the betterment of, uh, you know, the patient care as well as safety of our anesthesiologist also. See, in our country, we... A doctor becomes, you know, a specialist after so many years of hard work, sacrificing so many things. And oh. suddenly you see that person getting, you know, vandalized, a person that getting a raw hand from uh, unruly people and from even not protected by the government agencies or neither by the police nor by the court. I think one should be smart enough to, maybe honest, 
in an honest way, you should be smart enough to deal with everything. There are workshops going to be held in the future in every conference, major conference, like uh, how to communicate. This doesn't come, you know, easily. You Nobody is a good communicator from the birth. It comes with the learning, it comes with the incidences, it comes with the episodes, the bad episodes you see in your life. And once you start having that skill, I think it's come by age also. And my advice to every budding PG student here is if something goes wrong, always cry for help to your senior. Because in these type of scenarios, the senior is the best friend for you. And one question was there, I think, the who's a junior consultant, a senior consultant who's mm -hmm. anesthetizing. Never say like that. Say it's a team of anesthesiology. Always say it's a team of anesthesiology who are going to give you anesthesia, not one person. Because everybody's helping you. Junior may be putting a line, somebody intubating, somebody giving the drugs. So always say it's a team. Never say that the junior person is giving you anesthesia or is intubating. Anesthesia is a wholesome okay. procedure. So I think by these type of things, we have discussed a lot. It was a good topic, close to the heart. And uh, thank you, Nishant and Dr. Madhuri for uh, building up this team event and Dr. Parul for anchoring this uh, great show. And thank all the moderators, all the PG students for a wonderful discussion and all the delegates at audience. Because see, you already told CME, so all the delegates over here. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I think soon we will be for sending your certificates by email uh, because the new team of the GC is there. Certificates requires new signatures. So I've got the new signatures today. So your certificates will be mailed by Dr. Madhuri. So I think uh, this is the end of the CME. And we thank you, everyone. And we always end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.